Hi everyone. My name is Martin Koning and I work in the Wind River Technology Office on Emerging Technologies, especially relating to intelligent edge compute. We've recently been working on system architectures that enable real time and safety using Linux that I wanna share with you. Most of you know Wind River as an embedded OS company. Wind River is well known for real time and safety operating systems, our Linux embedded distribution, and also for our Wind River cloud platform, which is now powering live 5G infrastructure in the US, something we're very proud of. However, I know many of you have seen the digital transformation messaging and vision on our new website, and that story is bigger than any single product or any single company. The larger opportunity is to scale mission critical system value by leveraging a cloud connected intelligent systems approach. Many participants here at ARM Dev Summit are also on this journey. And together, we're finding significant benefits collaborating at the system and solution level. We're also finding new engagements from com companies and organizations that are coming to the intelligent edge from the IT cloud and telecom sectors as they all look to deploy and operate end-to-end -end cloud connected solutions right down to the cyber physical level of sensing, actuating and processing at the edge. Their diverse use cases are projecting new requirements into the embedded system space, requirements for new protocols, new service deployment mechanisms, such as containers, new middleware and new expectations about usability, extendability, dependability and scalability. Traditional embedded devices from decades ago were typically fixed function boxes that were designed, coded, tested, manufactured, and then sold. Now, device manufacturers create edge devices, which are connected devices, as the word edge implies. Edge devices need more than real time and safety. They must integrate into a broader end to end system easily. They need to be managed, often remotely. They need to be secured and they need to be trusted by those who use them. To achieve this, edge devices need more of the capabilities and core values from the IT, cloud, and telecom space, such as manageability and dependability. This is needed to enable edge devices to better integrate into the broader IT, cloud, and telecom infrastructure. These additional device side needs motivate a dramatic increase in software and compute. Sometimes the end result can be that the actual software and compute needed for the original purpose of the device ends up being just a small percentage needed by the device overall. To double click on, the, on this rise in system complexity, I'd like to tell you about something a CTO of a medical device company shared with me a couple of years ago. He said, we used to build infusion pumps. They were standalone embedded boxes that did what they needed to do and they were fairly simple. What we build now is an infusion management system that is under the hospital's IT department control and, it, and is integrated with the hospital's patient and staff database and its billing system. At that time, I thought this kind of application specific system integration was a corner case, but I now see this happening in all vertical markets. We only have to look to robots and cars to see how an intelligent system level approach and IT OT convergence is enabling new powerful use cases. Traditional standalone fixed function resource constrained embedded device projects are becoming rare. They're being disrupted by edge devices that are resource rich, multi core, multi OS integration platforms, which host a large and diverse amount of software integrated into a bigger solution and a larger value prop proposition. These end-to-end -end systems um, have system requirements, requirements that bring new challenges for device software. But of course, the situation is more complicated than that. New SOCs and boards can now be designed and brought to market faster than ever and have more powerful and more specialized concurrent hardware acceleration features that we wanna exploit from software. And the software workloads themselves are increasingly diverse due to hardware consolidation. We're at a point where single chip solutions often need to be able to run stringent real-time or safety workloads while implementing unprecedented levels of system management features at the same time. And that in itself brings requ requirements around security, connectivity, open source compatibility, and more. <laughs> 
A divide and conquer approach is needed, not just to manage software complexity, but also to enable element separation requirements motivated by CICD lifecycle, by fault propagation prevention, um, to be able to provision resources like memory, compute, and bandwidth to workloads, and for best practices for minimizing attack surfaces for security reasons. From the perspective of how all this projects onto edge compute, there are four meta trends to consider. Together, they're causing us to evolve our thinking on how to approach system architecture. At this high level, these may seem obvious, but we will zoom in on each of, the, each of these to get a bit more context. First, thanks to the continued advances in IC fabrication processes, Moore's Law continues to have momentum and we're taking advantage of it to create new generations of powerful multi-core SOCs while navigating Moore's gap, which I'll come back to on the next slide. Secondly, the sheer volume of software in modern intelligent cloud connected systems is driving software complexity to the point where monolithic system architecture is being reconsidered using partitioning. Actually, this meta trend is not just for software, but we're also seeing that applies to hardware partitioning of compute resources within SOCs as well. Third, commercial expectations regarding market windows and development timelines motivate platform developers to start with easily available open source software, whether operating systems, middleware, microservices, or even applications, and then add commercial value, sometimes just a veneer on top, rather than implement or assemble equivalents using proprietary implementations all the way down the software stack. And fourth, the ubiquitous availability of Linux at the edge. Okay, let's first uh, talk about Moore's Law and Moore's Gap. Moore's Law doesn't claim anything about performance. It just says we can fit in twice as many uh, transistors in the same size chip every two years. Denard scaling is a related law that states that as transistors get smaller, their power density stays the same because we can lower voltages and current and also reduce circuit delays in the chip, um, which means that clock frequencies can be increased. This was great for sil silicon developers for decades because the same size chip and power budget brought it forward into the next generation of microprocessor architecture um, or processor microarchitecture. Uh, they could give us all new features you know, that made the same linear code run faster than they did. They used those additional transistors to boost performance by increasing local caches, improving pipelines, implementing new instructions, integrating floating point, implementing concurrent instruction dispatch and including out of order and even doing speculative instruction execution and more. Well, we hit a wall and some call it Moore's Gap where it was harder to accelerate single thread performance using more transistors. The end result is that now silicon developers use those additional transistors to add accelerators, you know, bring, bring integrated peripherals into the chip and also to offer up multiple cores. Increasingly also multiple types of cores in the same chip configured into hardware partitions called compute islands. In the future, we'll continue to see even higher numbers of cores, accelerators and peripherals integrated into SOCs. Thanks to EDA tools and building blocks is now faster and easier than ever to create these specialized and customized multi-core chips. This is absolutely fantastic for hardware developers. And you know, it's why we are all here today because um, ARM is at the center of that. It also has a massive impact on systems and on software architectures. Cars are now software defined vehicles and every software feature you know, requires some amount of compute bandwidth and storage. Every feature has to be able to find the others in order to collaborate and coordinate. And that in turn requires more software for communication, middleware, high level services and frameworks. These, the numbers being shared within the automotive industry are showing that each decade there's 10 times the amount of software being integrated into cars. You can bet that all that software is not running on a single operating system instance or even on a single OS type. It is partitioned as a collection of applications that run on bespoke OSs that are deployed into one or more integration platforms, which can now be integrated in silicon using complex multi-core SOCs. 
To deal with all this software, we need a divide and conquer approach. We need to partition software so that we can extend it, reuse it, uh, provision parts of it, and even to manage the software development project itself. And then there's the importance of containing faults and determining which part of the system is experiencing an erroneous behavior and mapping that back definitively to the code that caused it. Partitioning software helps at so many levels. When we update software in a running system, we don't want to update or restart active systems unnecessarily. Again, partitioning of software can help with that. Meanwhile, there are many trends affecting the software landscape. Open source is becoming Linux open source. Open source projects increasingly are written to Linux APIs. And as Linux adds more features and software uses them, that software becomes less portable. Porting Linux software to a foreign runtime environment is a losing proposition, since it is something that would have to be done over and over again to enjoy updates brought by the open source community afterwards. There's a copy of Linux running in the system. It's so much easier to just run Linux open source on Linux. Larger services and applications now come with their own OS instance to avoid issues with host OS dependencies, such as version mismatch problems. These complete, complete execution environments might be virtual machines, containers, or even bare metal images that can run on a well-defined hardware layer. And then there are all the abilities we expect our converged IT OT systems to have now. I won't go through this list, um, but you can imagine the number of requirements and the amount of software needed to achieve these even partially. Other trends and options that are affecting our software choices are ready-made software, which is pre-configured platforms, middle, middleware and services, the need for trusted software, new requ requirements to instantiate software instances programmatically, so-called infrastructure as code, the variety of software that needs to come together to form a system, complex low-level drivers and firmware needed to light up hardware, and even variants of Linux itself, which may be helpful to have coexisting on the same hardware platform. The industry has voted with their feet on how to deal with all of this at the edge. And there's only one OS choice. Everyone is rallying around Linux. To double down on this point, let's attempt to prove it for devices capable of running Linux. We've established edge devices have large amounts of open source middleware and ready-made applications that are increasingly only available for Linux. We know board support packages for edge devices are increasingly only available for Linux. And we know porting code from Linux is increasingly problematic. Therefore, edge devices will increasingly be built with Linux. So if intelligent edge devices will have a copy of Linux in it, where will the real-time and safety-related workloads run? Well, the easiest solution is to just run them natively on Linux when Linux can meet the latency requirements. You know, and now that uh, preempt RT patches have been rolled in the 5.15 kernel, which is uh, great news. This is um, going to be coming to a kernel near you. You know, it's going to be in the main line. You know, and, and to take advantage of it, you know, you can provision some dedicated memory and compute for these workloads that use it and make sure they're not in interfered with by any other resource hogs. We can call this software-based workload partitioning because we use software techniques in Linux to partition the computer so that real-time and safety workloads can make progress in bounded time. Another approach is to put Linux in a virtual machine on a hypervisor, a hypervisor that has real-time or safety features, and run the real-time or safety workloads beside Linux. We can call this virtualization-based workload partitioning because a hypervisor is required to partition and enforce the virtual machines. And in some cases, it's scheduling them too. It's becoming more common to see multiple compute islands instantiated in the same SOC. These are basically complete you know, computers, like multiple complete computers, um, in the same SOC, and they're often connected with shared memory so they can collaborate. We can call this physical partitioning since there are dedicated physical computers for the real-time or safety workloads. For completeness, there's another way to partition hardware to achieve a hard real-time engine beside Linux, and that's to offline cores from Linux using CPU hot plug, for example, and then reactivate them with a real-time workload running from some dedicated physical memory that Linux doesn't manage. We've been calling this whiteboard partitioning since you really have to figure out ahead of time exactly which compute resources and devices will be used to, you know, by which partition to make sure they don't step on each other. This one's a lot of rope, so be careful with it. 
All right, this is a bit of an eye chart, but it's another way to see the landscape of scenarios for partitioning real-time and safety workloads with Linux. The software partitioning approach boots Linux on all the cores, and then we use Linux features to isolate a real-time workload, typically on its own core. This can be done with a user-level process using CPU reservation features in Linux to pin one or more threads to a core. That process could also be a unikernel, which helps reduce the number of system calls into Linux. It could also be a KVM-based virtual machine with one or more vCPUs running using CPU reservation. We'll call this soft real-time because it can achieve reactivity, but it's hard to guarantee it since there is still some non-determinism in Linux and the core can still enter the Linux kernel for, for system calls, traps, executions, and interrupts. So there's potential for interference. The whiteboard partitioning approach leverages the Linux CPU hotplug feature to take a core offline, and then we can restart it with a new payload in physical memory. That payload could be a native polling loop, although we've been using an RTOS running under a separate hy hypervisor that only runs on the offline cores. That protects Linux in case the workload crashes. This scenario can achieve hard real-time if the workload is hard real-time, but it isn't safety capable since Linux can still interfere with the hypervisor on that core or cores and thus the workload. The third scenario here is often referred to as a mixed criticality scenario, because if you use a safety capable hypervisor, you can mix safe and unsafe workloads on common hardware that the hypervisor partitions. And finally, we have a compute, the compute island scenario here where you have Linux running on a first CPU cluster and beside it in real time, um, beside it a real time or safety workload is running on a secondary computer in the same SOC. We know there is a need for some degree of real-time response in edge devices. There are also real-time requirements for the connectivity infrastructure, which are largely being pursued with 5G and TSN technologies these days. And clearly, there are use cases for real-time in industrial robots, in vehicles, medical devices, and drones, among others. Here's some general guidance on how to integrate real-time and safety workloads with Linux, depending on, on what you need. If your use case only needs tens of microseconds latency on average, and it can recover from an occasionally missed deadline, then it's perfectly reasonable to run Linux across all the cores and use CPU reservation to dedicate a core to a soft real-time thread running in a user level process or to a vCPU thread, perhaps running an RTOS in, in a VM. Keep in mind that it may be difficult to map your real-time devices into a user level process or virtual machine. And your mileage may vary with respect to the best approach, depending on the device in question because of that. If you need micro second-ish hard real-time or you need safety with no missed deadlines, then you need to run your workload either on a dedicated compute island or in a virtual machine running on a real-time or safety hypervisor and let Linux run beside it. Now, Linux is getting closer and closer to being able to run hard real-time and safety workloads. But if you need microsecondish and, and you need uh, certification for safety, then it's not, it's not there just yet. For the workload partitioning scenarios that have Linux with auxiliary runtimes, we need ways for those auxiliary runtimes to collaborate and integrate with Linux. In particular, we want them to be able to send any printf or console output to Linux. And we want them to be able to read and write files from Linux file systems when those file systems are available. And since it is likely that those auxiliary runtimes are more brittle to program on than Linux, we probably want to run most of the applications on Linux and only have the real-time or safety functions running on the auxiliary runtimes. That means we will need to split our applications across Linux and the real-time or safety auxiliary runtimes. And thus, we need some way to have them collaborate. The traditional way to do that in the cloud is to use TCP IP between partitions. For edge devices, using a WAN protocol like TCP IP is a heavyweight approach. So it's interesting to have an IPC mechanism that is more optimized to local communication and shared memory in particular, and hopefully still use the standard APIs. This is a problem space that we've been focusing on in the Linaro OpenAMP Application Services Working Group. Our goal is to enable auxiliary runtimes to cleanly integrate with Linux as real-time and safety offload engines. We want those auxiliary runtimes to be able to leverage Linux-based resources using standard APIs and also be reachable using high-speed local IPC APIs that are POSIX-based. 
Vert.io to the rescue. It's already available for Linux and for many of the runtimes that could be deployed as auxiliary runtimes beside Linux. Vert.io has an open specification and it has flexible connectivity options. It has AF VSOC, which is particularly nice for local IPC. Vert.io can in theory and now in practice be run over a shared memory without a hypervisor. And it is provided not only for low level device access, but also for higher level services like file systems and IPC. Here's a generalized hypervisorless Vert.io architecture where Linux owns the general purpose cores and devices and an auxiliary runtime is run using dedicated real timer safety cores. And they just have the devices required by their real timer safety workloads. Everything else is under Linux control. Each auxiliary runtime is a Vert.io front end with its own chunk of shared memory its own hardware notification mechanism to interact with Linux. And on Linux, it has its own Linux-based daemon as a Vert.io backend. The interesting aspect of this is that this architecture is common to all the partitioning scenarios that involve auxiliary runtimes, whether software partitioning using CPU reservation, whiteboard partitioning using core offload, virtualization partitioning using a real-time or a safety hypervisor, and physical partitioning with compute islands. It is helpful to have a common approach and common APIs that can unify multiple system architectures to enable software and knowledge reuse. Here you can see where memory is actually shared between the auxiliary runtime and the Linux-based daemon that provides it access to Linux services. This is shown for each of the scenarios involving auxiliary runtimes notably core reservation, core offload, mixed criticality, hypervisor, and compute islands. With Vert.io set up like this, an auxiliary runtime like a small RTOS or executive can offer ANSI standard IO for the purposes of output and file access. And it, it can also offer POSIX socket APIs for AFINet um, or AFVSOC IPC. Our approach was to enable socket-based IPC with AF INET first over Vert.io and then switch to AFVSOC, which really reduces the amount of code in the auxiliary runtime, while at the same time increasing IPC performance over the shared memory about 10x over TCP IP. Some conclusions from uh, this uh, work and this presentation. Partitioning at the OS instance level can help us manage system complexity within edge devices. Linux is critical to edge devices. Linux can still use help from auxiliary runtimes when the system has real-time and safety workloads that it cannot accommodate yet. Compute islands and complex multi-core SOCs are enabling mixed criticality systems using hardware partitioning as an alternative to real-time or safety hypervisors. Hypervisorless Vert.io is a promising approach to diverse workload integration on multi-cluster heterogeneous multi-core SOCs. All right, here's some links to further information and sources um, describing what we've done to KVM tool, which is what we used for the uh, Vert.io daemon on Linux and to enable hypervisorless use cases in general. As mentioned, this work is being done under guidance from the Linaro OpenAMP Community Project working group on application services. Please consider reaching out to our group if you are interested to participate in this community effort. Finally, I should mention that this activity is sponsored by my employer, Wind River, as it is aligned with our vision for mission critical intelligence systems, including those that leverage Linux at the edge. Wind River Studio is a cloud native platform for the development, deployment, operation, and servicing of intelligent systems. You can get a tour of Wind River Studio at the link on the screen. Thank you.